morning. morning. Hopefully you all haven't waited for me, but it was a, felt like a very hectic morning getting all the, all the pieces in place for some reason today. Maybe I'm just a bit disorganized today. Uh, all right, I'm disorganized all the time. Um, but it's so good to see all of you here, and it is uh, just always such a joy to gather together um, to see each other's faces, to be able to converse with one another, and the most important and wonderful thing is that God is with us. The Lord Jesus Christ is with us. The Holy Spirit is moving among us. Listen, see, experience the presence of God this morning. Do we have any announcements today? Joy, that's a surprise. <laughs> Thank you. Denise. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody. I got like a big surprise this week. <laughs> Actually, Bonnie Goose and Kathy Matt came to my house and they were really sneaky and they showed up at my house with balloons and flowers and gift cards, um, all for Administrative Assistance Day. And that was from the whole church. <laughs> so thank you all so much. It really made my day special. Thank you so much. Well, you know the best part about that, Denise? <laughs> is that you make every day special so uh, thank, thank you so very much for so much. Um, all that you do for the care and compassion that you have and the uh, for your ministry Greg we've got an outreach program we've been working on that started last year and then the pandemic hit and it is um, raised beds. We're hoping to get people to come in from the community and use them for free. Um, the Anna Lyons has given us a couple thousand dollars to develop. Uh, so right now I'm meeting volunteers to help next Saturday build them. And uh, we've got pictures of the whole layout and how they are. And I'm hoping to build one as an example and bring it. But otherwise it would be just a raw lumber and metal and all that. We we'll have to just assemble it. Come up on, I'm gonna pass around the same Okay, yes. Um, and and this is a uh, really uh, exciting ministry. I mentioned it uh, to the other pastors of uh, the churches around us um, yesterday morning, and they all thought it sounded like such a great idea. They were planning on uh, doing this next year. They recognize it's too late this year for them to get going, but, uh, and they, they did ask if um, Greg would be willing or any of the rest of us who have some experience this year with building the boxes or just with uh, having a green thumb to, to share with them and, and be a resource and a guide for them. So um, if you like to build things, definitely next Saturday um, come and help. And if you uh, like to grow things, um, I'm sure uh, people who are hopefully going to utilize these that don't know how to garden um, would like some guidance. And the, the most exciting part about this outreach project is not just to provide people the way to grow some vegetables, but provide ways for us to interact with people so that we can grow disciples of Jesus Christ. And I pray that we will have a bumper crop. We'll be able to provide some master gardeners too for training the people who need it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm taking a course right now to produce where you just raised beds. So thank you, Greg. Uh, I appreciate your heart. Greg mentioned it last year when he realized that uh, Hannah qualifies as a food desert um, because uh, you have to go so far in order to get food other than rumors in the hub, but 
you know, for, for your own food, that's uh, uh, an unfortunate situation. Um, but so thank you, Greg, for your heart and willingness to, to tackle this. And he'll be passing around a sign-up sheet. Any other announcements? If not, then let us open our worship with prayer. Heavenly Father, as we gather together this morning to worship you, to sing songs to you, to pray, and to ponder your word, we ask that your spirit inflame our hearts, that you help us to hear your word and to act upon what we hear. We pray, Lord, that you help us to show our love to one another, to guide one another, and to lead one another out into the community, to spread the good news of Jesus Christ, and to spread the love that we experience among us, so that all people might know the source of that love, your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let us now sing our opening hymn, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Indeed, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, for a million tongues to sing, for every tongue on earth to sing the glories of his name. That's our mission. That's what God is calling us to do, is to share with people the joy that we have in Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we come to the time where we share with each other our uh, prayer concerns, our joys, our celebrations. Um, does anybody have anything they'd like to lift up this morning? Kathy. An unspoken prayer from Kathy. Anyone else? Rita. I'd like to ask people to continue to pray for my nephew, Brad Bishop, who has been diagnosed with esophageal cancer. We will continue to pray for Brad. Mike. I'd like a prayer for my neighbor, Tim Haynes. He was in an auto accident uh, almost three weeks ago, and he broke his neck. Uh, but the uh, good news is he's just wearing a brace, and he might not have one surgery. Good. What was his first name? Tim. Tim. Right. Carol. Unspoken. An unspoken for Carol. Um, also, uh, Robin had asked me to ask for prayers for an unspoken concern for her. Well, it's not for her, it's for a friend. But. Bill. My name is Terry Garner. Uh, he's in the Elk Park Hospital uh, for heart operation. 
Prayers for Terry. Anyone else? Um, like prayers for um, my wife's friend, um, Vanessa, uh, her brother who went to school and grew up with Sherry passed away Friday um, after a year long battle with COVID. So um, Sherry's rather heartbroken this weekend. And on our continuing list, um, we have uh, Denise's friend Janelle, Michelle Moreska, James Early, Linda Hunsley, Beth Laker, Michael Rotko. Mike, how's your sister Jane doing? Uh, she's still waiting for some. some okay, well, we will keep praying for Jane. Uh, Linda Thatcher, Tom and Bev Hill, Jim and Judy Yeoman, Judy Carter, Don and Nora, Arlene's friend Susie, Bill, my brother-in-law and sister, Buddy and Brenda, and my mom, Gloria. So let us take all of these things and those other unspoken concerns in our heart to our Lord in prayer, entrusting everything to him who in his wisdom takes care of all of us in the way that his love, his grace, and his power can. Heavenly Father, there are people that we love so much, people that mean so much to us, who suffer illness and injury, who suffer doubts and struggles in life, people who suffer with continuing sin, people who suffer with addictions, people who suffer with financial insecurity, food insecurity, people who suffer with broken relationships. There is so much suffering. But we know, Lord, that your Son, Jesus Christ, suffered on our behalf. Not that it takes away every experience in life that can cause suffering, but that knowing that Jesus walks with us, knowing that Jesus has felt what we feel, we know that we are not alone. We know that you are present with us, and we know, as Paul witnessed to us, that your grace is sufficient. We thank you, Lord, for your grace, and we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your word that you are always speaking to us, that you are always sharing with us. Help us, Lord, to hear your voice, to follow your lead, and to share what we encounter, what we learn, what we know of you with those around us. Help us to encourage one another. Help us to forgive one another. Help us to lead one another. And in all things, help us, Lord, to just be your people, gathered together as the body of Christ, living secure in the knowledge that all of the trials of this life will be healed by your love. Today, tomorrow, or in the life to come, we put our hands, our lives, our whole trust in you. And as the gathered people who follow your Son, Jesus Christ, we lift up our voices together to pray as he taught us. <coughs> our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture this morning is from the 10th chapter of John, verses 11 to 18. Listen for and hear what God is saying to us and to you 
through these words of Scripture. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Lord, help us to hear your word. Help us to encounter your living word. And help us to not only be the sheep of your flock, but to be not like the hired hand, but help us, Lord, to live our lives, whether we lay them down or take them up, so that all of those sheep and all of those other folds might come to know the love and the care of the shepherd, your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So on Friday, I went to visit my mom. And at the nursing home where my mom is at, um, if a resident has a private room when you visit, they're allowing you to visit in the room. My mom doesn't have a private room anymore. So when you visit somebody that has a roommate so that you don't expose the roommate to any virus you might bring in, they have you sit in one of the common areas, and they bring the, the resident to you. Well, in the, in the past, they've always had me way at the back end of the building, which is near my mom's room. I figured they want to keep me out of sight as much as possible. But Friday, they had me sit in the front common area, right by the door where visitors and staff come in and out right next to the check-in station where they take your temperature and ask you all those questions. Have you had COVID in the last 90 days? Have you traveled more than two counties away in the last 90 days? And all those sorts of things. And right across this common area, it's like a big living room, is the uh, dining room for the assisted living section. And the activities people were leading a game of bingo for, for some of the residents. And when they brought my mom to me, my mom's voice is very, um, very weak these days. And to be honest, most of the words that she says are kind of nonsensical. She can't really put sentences together too well, but, but once in a while she does. So as we visited, with all of the commotion of people coming in and out, people being checked in and tested, you know, their temperature and things, and bingo going on in the background. I had to concentrate so hard to hear anything my mother said. And I had to really work at trying to see, was she saying something that made sense that I could intelligently respond to? Or was it just well, gibberish? And, and mom was doing pretty well that day, so I think she was saying 
some, you know, we were able to have somewhat of a conversation, although she did not know who I was. But just when I'd be listening, I'd hear B10, I22, bingo. It took so much work and effort to try to listen and hear what my mom was saying that I missed 95% of it. We were together. She knew somebody was there caring for and visiting her, and that's the important thing. But we couldn't have any kind of meaningful conversation. I trust that I was able to communicate to my mom the love that I have for her. And I know that my mom loves me. But the content of the conversation was completely lost to both of us. And that made me think of Elijah. I'm going to quote this. After Elijah had defeated the 400 prophets of Baal and the evil queen Jezebel threatened Elijah that she was going to kill him, Elijah got really depressed and he went out in the desert to die. Now, I must admit that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, though I understand the sentiment. Because you're upset because somebody's threatened to kill you, so you go out in the desert to die. Either way, you're dead. Um, but this is what happened when Elijah was in the desert. The Lord came to Elijah and said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. Or I, I like the versions that say, a still, small voice. And that was the voice of God, this gentle whisper, this still small voice. And it's really kind of the same situation that it was with me trying to have a, a visit with my mom. There are so many loud things wind, earthquake, fire, bingo. All the things that are going on in my own head, all the things that are going on out in the world that to concentrate, to give attention, to listen for, and to hear what God is saying to me, to us, it's really easy to miss it. It's really easy to get so wrapped up in all of the bingo stuff going on in our own mind and lives that it's very difficult to hear that God is speaking to my heart, if you're like me, to your heart. In some of these bingo things, there are our own agendas, there are our own biases, they are our own preferences. I, I, I'm going to tell this story. It was in 2003 at my church in Crown Point was holding a big public forum with a panel discussion talking about a rather controversial issue in the nation at the time. They flew in uh, somebody from Washington, D.C., who serves on the general board of uh, church and society for the denomination. They had a, a local pastor there from Lake County who was kind of uh, a moderate. He was speaking about the issue from a pastoral point of view. And we had one of the prominent people in the Indiana Conference who led the uh, conservative caucus of the conference. Now, I want to be really clear. The story I'm about to tell has nothing to do with liberal versus conservative. That's totally beside the point. But I mention it because 
the conservative voice, who's somebody that you would think would reliably put their whole faith in Jesus Christ. He had something to say that I found deeply disturbing. And as the, the conversation went on, the panel was discussing um, the person from Washington and the, the local pastor, they were on one side of this issue. And the other guy was on the other side. Um, and I must admit, I found his argument kind of weak. His, his argument was basically, um, we have to trust the government because God has put these people in place, but we should not trust the denominational leaders because God did not put them in their place. Which I, I, don't, I don't buy that. And during the question and answer period, I raised my hand. And that was back when WWJD was really a big issue, you know, big, very popular. And I asked him if Jesus were sitting up there physically on the panel with you, which side of this issue do you believe Jesus would be on? And this man said, well, Jesus would be on the other side of the issue. But there's other parts of scripture that justify my point of view. Well, I have to say, he lost the audience in that moment. Because to confess that he's on the opposite side of an issue than what he believes Jesus would be on. That's, have you been listening? That's what I, I want to ask him. Were you listening? Were you even listening to yourself? How can any Christian intentionally think that their view on a topic is wiser and more correct than what they think Jesus' view on that topic would be? It's because of the bingo. Bouncing around in our mind. All of those things that we bring to a situation. Our biases. Our prejudices the sum total of the things that we have experienced, the things that we hold really dear that we want to protect, not realizing that we don't have to protect anything. That's Christ's job. That's God's job. Our job is to listen and hear Jesus Christ and live what we hear. And I don't mean to blame this gentleman who seemed to be on the wrong side, at least from the side that he himself put Jesus on. Because I know the man, very committed Christian, excellent Bible scholar. To this day, you know, at least the last time we gathered for annual conference, he always presents petitions to the conference. He always speaks on all the issues. He's very engaged. But at least on that day in 2003, he wasn't listening. I don't want to presume why, but I know for myself, to hear the still, small voice of God requires that I quiet my own mind, that I quit playing bingo in my own mind trying to win some sort of cheap prize in the world and miss the ultimate prize that comes from giving my whole life to God in Christ. But it does take a lot of work. And we have to be very careful. Maybe this was what happened to that gentleman. We have to be very careful that the voice that we think is from God is not our own voice, or not perhaps the voice of something far, far more evil than that. We have to be careful that the voice that we hear, that we believe is God, is indeed the voice of God. So how do we do that? Fortunately, we have many tools at our disposal. Number one is, is this consistent with Scripture? 
This guy thought his argument was consistent with Scripture, but he acknowledged that it wasn't consistent with the Gospels. So we need to look at the whole message of Scripture and recognize that sometimes taking the word at face value needs some interpretation. Jesus showed us how to do this when he said, you have heard it was written, an eye for an eye. That's in scripture. But I say to you, forgive your enemy. If I'm going to weigh two things in scripture, I hope that I give more weight to what Jesus actually said than perhaps a misinterpretation of what the law that was in place until Jesus came. That, that's one way to make sure that we are hearing the voice of God. The other way is to talk it out with other mature Christians. John Wesley called that Christian conferencing. And it's very helpful, I find this very helpful, to have a conversation with somebody who sees it differently than I do. If I just go and talk to people who I know already think like I do, we might just be reinforcing our own thoughts to really get to the question of what is God saying to us. It requires checking to see if maybe God is revealing to somebody else some truth that I'm missing. And perhaps the most powerful is to take time to sit in quiet in silence out in nature whatever works for you but when you're praying don't just keep making your requests known to God don't just keep saying words I would suggest half of our prayer time should be in silence, listening for what God is saying to us. That takes practice. And at first, it's really uncomfortable. And the bingo keeps going in our minds, and we're trying to silence and listen to God, and we hear, B10, because we just had some thought that's going to distract us and lead us away from God's voice. when we keep practicing, when we keep working at it, we can experience a peace and a stillness of the soul where God's voice is no longer quite so still and small. But when we find out that God is speaking loud and clear, the problem isn't that God's voice is weak like my mother's voice is. The problem is, is that our minds and our hearts are so loud. Cultivate the ability to listen to God. Be willing to let God say what God has for you, even if maybe it doesn't fit into what you want God to be saying. Lean on one another to help discern the voice of God and check everything with Scripture. And in doing so, what you're really doing is taking ownership for your own relationship with God and Jesus Christ. You're taking ownership for all of the things that are mingling in your mind, for all of the opinions that you hold, for all of the beliefs, for even the things that you hold dear. When you listen to God and take ownership for your own life, that God is able to work within us to bring about a transformation, to strengthen those things that are in line with God's will, and to correct those things that are maybe off the mark a little bit. For our living the call this morning, um, I'm going to show a video um, it's from Pastor Tim Johnson. Uh, He's been teaching us in the Multiplication Network, which is a nine-month training that uh, Joy, Denise, Nicole, 
Films and myself have been doing. And uh, they sent this out this past week. It doesn't perfectly have to do with what I've been talking about, but it kind of does. So, Glenn, could you start the uh, video? We started our first one back in December, if you remember, December 31st. We ended 2020 with a fire pit video. We started 2021, January 1st, with a fire pit video. We've been trying to do these about once a month. Just your pastor sharing, your friend, uh, your brother in Christ sharing his heart about maybe something the Holy Spirit has laid on my heart. Uh, and uh, so, again, welcome back to the fire pit. Uh, we hope to do these uh, on a regular basis. There is something different today about the fire pit, if you noticed. There is no fire in the fire pit today. So let me explain. Um, it's, first of all, it's not my fault. I thought that someone would start the fire for me. Now, to make sure I'm clear, I didn't ask anyone to start a fire for me. I, no one knew that I was gonna have a fire pit video. I didn't let anyone know that I needed to collect the wood and, and, and build the fire and tend the fire, but I guess I had hoped or expected that someone would do that. And so I just want to make sure we're clear that we have a fire pit video today with no fire. And it's not my fault. Okay, so just make sure we're clear. Cool? Make sense? I hope it doesn't make sense. I hope you're sitting there thinking that's ludicrous, Pastor Joe. That's just crazy. That's nuts so. But that is our culture today. That's our it's our culture today. We don't take ownership. That's the word today. We just don't take ownership. We blame it. Again, if the world doesn't do it, then that's fine. The world is the world. But I'm talking about Christians. I'm talking about saints. Saints. I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ. One of the videos, just a couple of videos ago, we talked about the five marks of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And one of those was a deep maturity. And if you want to dissect that, part of being mature is taking ownership of your life, especially taking ownership of your passion, your fire, spiritual fire, your, your commitment to the kingdom. We have so many across this country who have blamed other things and other people for not coming to church, for not keeping their faith in Christ, you name it. Whether it's being offended by what a pastor has said because the church isn't meeting in a church building, because they're requiring masks, you name it. There has, been, there has not been a shortage of supply of things that people could use to blame other things and other people for their own spiritual fire. It's just crazy. So as young parents, Pam and I, we knew, uh, we, we felt like that this was going to be an important part of our parenthood and parent growth was to teach our children how to take ownership. And one of those ways is apologies. So here's, here's, a, here's a way that I hear a lot of apologies. I'm sorry, but deserve it. I'm sorry, but I'm not. Or, I'm sorry if I hurt you. I'm sorry if you got offended. Those are really poor examples of ownership. Here's what we taught our children in the terms of apologies. Please forgive me for hurting you. There's a period at the end of that church. Please forgive me for hurting you. So again, ownership, I think it's so key, and I think it's part of our maturity and discipleship. Really quick, there's a, a passage of scripture. It's in 2 Samuel 24. This is King David here at the end of his life. Now he failed again. He counted, he took a census of his people. He wanted to count how many people he had in his army. Listen to that. He wanted to count his people to see how many people were in his army. Spiritual pride and arrogance caused him to go against what God wanted him to do. And so even Joab, is the commander of the army, said, you shouldn't do this, David. He did it. Long story short, a plague came upon the people, killed 70,000 people in three days, right? And, and finally, uh, the angel of the Lord stopped the plague, and, and David wanted to offer a sacrifice to the Lord and say thank you for disciplining me, but also being merciful and ending the plague only in three days. So he saw this piece of ground called the threshing floor. It's a high place. It's a high hill. And uh, Aramu was the one who owned it. He wasn't even a, a, a Hebrew. He was a Jebusite. And King David asked if he could buy that property from him to build an altar. And, and Aramu said, well, you're the king. I'm not going to make you pay for it. 2 Samuel 24, verse 24, key passage. It says this. King David replied to Aramu, Far be it from me to offer a sacrifice 
that cost me nothing. You know what David was learning? Ownership. At that moment, he owned ownership. I pray, church, that we will own the things in our lives that we need to own. I pray that you will own your spiritual fire. I pray you will earn own your, your spiritual commitment to the kingdom, your spiritual fervor, your, your, your own passion and your own perseverance for the kingdom and your own service to the king and his kingdom. Amen? So here's the word. Ownership. I pray you will take ownership. I have a feeling next fire pit video, we'll have a fire in this here fire pit. But for now, will you reflect on maybe just maybe where you need to take ownership of your spiritual body. Be blessed, church, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. The point I wanted to make with that video was not really so much about the apologies. It was good teaching. But it was about taking ownership for our spiritual fire. And our spiritual fire comes from the word of God. When we take the time, own the time, to listen for God, we will have hearts aflame with love of God and love of neighbor. Ownership is a very individual and personal thing. Except it's not really, because we have to help one another to take ownership. We have to support and encourage one another. We have to love one another. We have to check our own bingo with one another to see if we as a community of faith can discern the word of God among us. Amen. Let us pray. God of compassion, God of grace. We are thankful for your guidance and protection. We are thankful that you speak to us all the time, in all circumstances. But we confess that there are times when we fail to acknowledge that your voice is even there. And we confess that there are times when we let all of the noisiness of the world in our lives drown out your voice, drown out your word. Help us to hear your voice and to discern your direction and to help one another that we might follow you and lead others into life eternal so that they too can hear the voice of God in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us now sing our closing hymn, Savior Like a Shepherd Leads.
know we hear the voice of God. When it fills our hearts with love. When it moves our hands and feet to serve. And when it opens our mouth to speak good news to the world. So go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Listening for, hearing, and living the word that God has given us. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word of God is Jesus Christ. Have a blessed week. Thank you.